yet. Um, a lot of fun characters. We have a, a fun adult joining us that has never joined us before, and it, it's going to be a great time. Um, but like he said, stay engaged, stay plugged in, stay connected. Pastor Adam and I are available if you guys need to talk to either one of us. Um, if you don't have our numbers, see us after church, and we'll be glad to give you our numbers so you have them. Um, most of you guys have the church numbers in the bulletin as well, and plus you can find that easily online. But just get with one of us. And But if you guys will stand, we're going to get ready to worship. <laughs>
You are mighty and worthy to be praised, God. We lift you up in this place, God. There's none above you. There's none beside you. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. And one day everybody's going to bow down and say to you, God, we worship you, Father.
Thank you so much, worship team. So the series that Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, wow, Pastor Matt started last Sunday, Life Interrupted. It's it's crazy. We started writing series out probably like six months in advance as a staff just to kind of get an idea. And basically what it was was for me. So that way in kids' church, I could do the same series he was doing in here in adult service. So the kids and adults could, the goal is, so that way ultimately parents can have conversation about church, what was taught about in church, and the kids could be like, hey, we learned about that too. And here's what I got about that. Here's what it, God spoke to me about it. And it's been neat watching the kids because the kids will come back to me on the next Sunday or that Wednesday night and say, hey, mom and dad were talking about this. And they learned this, but this is what I learned. And so I'm hearing them come back to me. So I don't know what you guys are hearing at home or if they're even saying anything at home about it. But it's kind of neat because it reinforces that. And it causes that table time discussion of, okay, here's what we're learning about in church. And here's what God's speaking. And, and this one, when we started talking about Christmas, we started talking about how we didn't want to do a traditional Christmas series. Because... Most of us in this room have been in church long enough that we've heard traditional Christmas series, which there's nothing wrong with them. They're great. They're wonderful. And there's so much principle. But something that we forget to think about, and as we're talking about it, I was like, what about life interrupted? Pastor Adam and I were like, well, everybody's life got interrupted at Christmas. Christmas interrupted everybody and everything. 
and w- so we began to dive into that, and we're like, okay, we'll talk about different characters each week, so that way we can see how the Christmas story impacted everybody's life, because everybody's life had a different take of what happened in the Christmas story. And so today, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 2, and as you're turning there, last week you guys should have learned about the innkeeper and the shepherds. And I know in kids' church, as we're talking about the innkeeper and the shepherds, a lot of them didn't know the different things. A lot of them never thought about how the innkeeper could have made room for Mary and Joseph, but they didn't. They decided to give them the leftovers. And then the shepherds, a lot of the kids didn't understand that back in Bible days, if you were a shepherd, you didn't have a voice. A lot of people, although you had a voice, a lot of people didn't hear you. They didn't listen to you because you weren't of prestige. You didn't have high rank. It was almost like a like a woman in that society. They weren't heard. They were they existed heavier than people think or realize because they carry the weight of it if we're not careful as parents or adults. So Matthew chapter two. Today we're going to be talking about King Herod and the wise men, and and really these two are probably two of my favorite. Um, as far as the interruption, just how different they responded. But Matthew chapter 2, if you've got it, if you'll stand with me, we're going to read this. We're starting in verse 2 and going through verse 18. And it says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star before. When, we ro- when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the, pri- the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was born, was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Jerusalem or to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I might come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went and on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. He sent and and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old and under, according to the time that had been ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping out in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because there were no more. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it was written, God, to not just speak of the time and what happened, God, but to speak to our hearts and minds today, God, because your word is still alive and it is still well and it still speaks to us. And we thank you for what we can learn from it. And we just ask today you open our hearts and help us receive. God, and use me as your mouthpiece to speak the word that you have given us and you have laid upon our hearts. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. You may be seated. So there's a lot in this scripture that we can take apart, and I'm going to dive in it as much as I can. I'm not going to hit every point. 
um, it's like I did last week with the kids. I'm going to give you three things that we're going to take away from pink hair, and there's going to be three things that we can take away from the white hair. But as we know, though, before we jump in there, life interruptions, they cause us a lot of heartache and grief. It's not something that any of us expect. We don't plan for. We don't think, okay, I'm going to wake up today. And those of you that drink coffee, you, you go to your coffee pot and you plan to turn on your coffee pot. Well, guess what? It doesn't work. That would be a life interruption. Or you go to your vehicle and your vehicle don't start. Or you have a flat tire. Or you have a kid that's sick when you wake them up in the morning. Or whatever it may be, you fill in the blank. We've all had them. We've all had those moments of life-changing, life interruptions. And we all see them, and they all affect us in different ways. And there's, according to our text today that we're going through, there's two different ways that we can respond according to these people. And the first person we're going to talk about is King Herod. King Herod wasn't expecting this interruption at all. He wasn't expecting Jesus to be born. He wasn't expecting the people to be coming to him and saying, hey, where's this child that should be born king of the Jews? If you're king and you have somebody born and they're telling you he's king of the Jews, could you imagine how threatened he feel, He felt? Like, wait, I'm king. And now you're telling me there's another king? There's somebody else born? And not only is there another king, but he's a child? What is a child doing? Or, you know, like, why are they all in a, in a scurry trying to figure this out when I'm king? They need to be worried about me and what I've got planned and not worried about somebody else. And so we know that King Herod wasn't expecting this interruption, although he could have went and looked at Scripture and the scrolls at that time, and he would have seen that it was prophesied years ago that there would be a child born, and he could have known that would happen. But he probably thought, like the rest of us, oh, it's not going to happen in my time or in my generation, or I'm not going to see it come to pass. They've said this for years, and it's not happened yet, so why am I going to believe it's going to happen now? So the takeaway number one that we can get from King Herod is his interruption caused him to be troubled. And we know this by verse 3, because it said, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. By definition, the word troubled means distressed, or anxious. So that means King Herod, because he heard this news, became distressed and he became anxious by what he heard. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to respond. He didn't know how to function. But not only did it affect him, it says it affected all the people. Because all of us know, just even from our homes, however mom and dad's acting and responding to things, guess what? The kids are going to respond. You can always tell what's going on. Ms. Glenn and I were talking about this this morning. We can always tell what's going on with a kid based upon how they're acting in school or for me on the school bus or in kids' church because their behavior starts acting out. And it might not always be bad behaviors. It could be overly loving. We have one little girl in common that she is the sweetest, most precious thing, but lately she's been extra clingy. And you're talking about a child who is not clingy. And so we know something is going on. She, her life is being interrupted in some way, somehow. But King Herod's interruption, when his trouble and distress and anxiousness is coming, it's affecting all the people, and he's starting to act out in ways that he probably wouldn't normally do. Because how many of you know if you have a leader, like a king, we want them to have it in order. I mean, you look at our president. We want our president to know what he's doing. We want him to be confident in the decisions he's going to make. Regardless, that, that's what we want. We want somebody who's confident because we want somebody who's going to make the right decisions, who are going to do the right thing. So as king, he has that same expectation as like our president would. And so when people are, are seeing this distress and this anxiousness and this trouble, they're doing the same thing. They're going about their life and they're probably not sleeping good at night. They're probably not eating good anymore. They're probably going around talking, hey, have you heard what's going on? What's this problem going on? Or, hey, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? King's having a problem. What are we going to do? Like, he can't get it together. But that's that's the first thing he did. And, and those of us that, that know when it comes to interruptions, that's probably not the way to respond, especially when you're, when you've got all these things going on. We know he was threatened by it. I mean, as a king, you couldn't you couldn't say you weren't threatened. That's probably part of his trouble. He probably wasn't confident enough to say, 
okay, there was another king born. Let me go see who he is. But instead, he was like, man, this is competition to me. This is this is a threat to me. So let me let me raise up. Let me become worried. Let me become fearful. And so his emotion, because what we do in private, when nobody else is looking, when our door is closed, when there's nothing to be seen, but me and God, how I act then will be eventually how I act in public. It will be how I act around other people. It will be how I respond. And so the Bible even says that King Herod secretly talked to the wise men because he didn't want everybody to know because he was already having so many issues. He didn't want everybody to know what he was doing. And I don't believe that King Herod even wanted to go worship Jesus. I believe from the beginning he probably wanted to go kill him. But he wanted to say, I'm going to go worship him. So that way the wise men wouldn't be caught in the trap of thinking, well, we're about to get this guy killed, and we don't want to do that. But it caused them to act deceitful. It caused them to do things that he wouldn't normally do. And sometimes our life interruptions can do the same thing. It, it can cause us to make choices that we wouldn't make. Think about a family who's maybe lost a job, lost income, and now they have no longer have the money to put food on the table. I bet Mr. Vince can tell us that's a lot of times when we see theft increase in people is because there's a lack in the home. There's a lack of finances. So a lot of people probably don't have the money anymore, so instead of going to try to find help, they just go and take for themselves. They begin to take because they're acting out of an interruption. But instead of saying, hey, I need help, they're saying, hey, I'm going to be deceitful and I'm going to do it for myself because I've done it myself my whole life. And so King Herod, instead of saying, hey, I need help, he deceitfully said, well, I'm going to do this my way. I'm not going to go to my people and say, hey, let's figure this thing out together. He said, I'm going to go do this privately so this can happen. So eventually, guys, we know what's in the heart's going to come out. The Bible tells us time and time again, even in, in Proverbs, there's several scriptures out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we know that eventually King Herod's life is going to overflow publicly. It's just a ticking time bomb of warning. And it started from the moment he was troubled to now he's at that next step of making decisions he wouldn't have normally made. And he, Guys, I know of an amazing two-year-old little boy back there. I actually know of three boys that are two years of age or younger back there. That if somebody laid a hand on them, there'd be a whole church folks group of church folks going after him because we love him and we couldn't imagine what would happen if something like that happened and, but to think that King Herod his private, his heart that interruption that troubled him, that, that caused him to be deceitful now pushed him to kill but not just kill anybody but guys I don't know about you but like a little two year old or under, yeah they might cry yeah they might throw fits, yeah they might go through diapers like crazy, they might bite sometimes, they they might just want to eat random things and pick up all the dirt on the floor, but you can't help but love them. So how in the world could you want to kill an innocent child, two years of age or younger, just because you were so threatened as an adult? Guys, King Harry was an adult, it wasn't like he was a a kid threatened by another kid. I mean, he was a grown adult man leading a nation of people that became so threatened by a child that he wanted to end his life. I couldn't imagine those mothers, how they felt when that order went out and those babies were being killed. I couldn't imagine being a mother that had a male child under the two or under in that point in time because I would rather them kill me than kill my baby. My kids might get on my nerves time in and time out. They might drive me up the wall. But let me tell you something. Don't harm my babies. Don't, don't harm them. Because those are my babies. And I love them dearly. I mean, we all know they, we, we love them, but they drive us crazy. But guess what? They're just like us in ways. The things about them that drive us crazy are the things in us that drive ourselves crazy. We just don't know how to fix it. But I couldn't imagine that heartache of the mothers or even the fathers. Because the, here the fathers are trying to comfort the mothers. Or if they had any siblings, could you imagine having to tell 
your older siblings, hey, I'm sorry, but little brother is not ever coming home because the king told him. But we don't, what we don't think about it on that interruption there that it caused him is his interruption, the way he responded, didn't just destroy him, but it destroyed all of those that came in contact with him that same day. Because think about the families that were destroyed. What about the families that their baby was destroyed and they had no hope of Jesus? Their lives were over. Their life was ended in that moment. What about those siblings crying out for their baby siblings? I mean, we all know brothers and sisters fight like crazy, but at the end of the day, guess what? They're each other's best friends, and they want what's best for each other. They couldn't live life without him. Not like this. I mean, if it was an accident, people could probably live with it a lot better than somebody intentionally killing their life. But that's what his interruption did. It caused him to change from the inside out. And it caused him to destroy everything in his path by sinning. But I often wonder what their conversations were like as they traveled. Were they talking about what they ate or what they were going to eat or what they were going to see? Were they talking about how crazy the king was that they just left? What were they talking about? What was their, you know, were they silent because they were unsure? Because they had already come looking for the scar because they were wondering about it. They were curious about it. So we already know that they wanted to know. They were intrigued by this scar. Like, what does this scar have to do? They could be talking about the scar. What does it mean? What is it pointing to? What are we about to see? Who are we about to meet? I, I, I just, it'd be one of those moments you'd want to be a fly on the wall. And since, you know, they're on camera, so you'd probably want to be a fly on the camel just to hear the conversations, you know, were they bickering at each other? You know, who's going to go in first? Who's going to give what gift? Or were they, was there excitement or what? But we know that their interruption took them on a journey. It took them on a journey away from their home that they were willful to go. Even though the king had done it secretly, they wanted to go because they were curious. The second thing we know from the wise men, the takeaway we got, is their interruption allowed them to meet their Savior. Verse 10, it says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with his, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They fell down and worshipped him. I almost wonder what kind of worship this was. Because they got excited when they saw the star. I almost think, you know, because the Bible talks about having childlike faith, I almost feel like these wise men had childlike faith when they saw that star. It was almost like a kid on Christmas morning waking up and seeing all the presents. But the one thing they sought after, they finally felt close and personal. And they were excited because they were ready to see what they were about to open. They had no idea that they were going to meet their Savior. And so I imagine when they opened that door, they probably couldn't get in fast enough. And I feel like their worship, it says they fell down and worshipped him. I know that back in those days you, you worshipped the, your king, but I bet this kind of worship they fell before him because of such love in their heart for him, for such this peace in their heart that said, Satan, this is my first king, and I'm going to worship him because I have a choice to worship this king. He's not forcing me to fall down and worship him. He's not begging me to because, Dad, he's a king. that day, and they had no idea in that moment that this child would grow up and one day would be crucified on the cross and become the Savior of the world. But in that moment, they gave the best gift that they could give of gold, frankincense, of myrrh, and they worshipped the King. They were some of the first people, they weren't the first, but they were some of the first people to worship him as a King. Imagine how powerful that is. That your life interruption causes you to worship the King. To worship Jesus. Did they necessarily want to go on a journey? We don't know for sure. 
but they were true. And that journey touched them when they got there. The one who would not only save them, but would change their world. All they had to do was see him. And there they were in that moment. I could imagine that present walking in. Probably be the most peaceful thing they've ever felt in their entire life. Would probably be the most overwhelming, joyful feeling they ever had because they knew this king wasn't the same king that they had met before. This king wasn't harsh. Well, first of all, I mean, he was under two years old. They're not very mean at that point in life. They're still very sweet and tender and loves people and, and wants to just please you. I could imagine Jesus as a, as a child looking up at them with curiosity. Thinking, this boy is so different from these people who bring me gifts. He probably didn't know what the gifts were. He didn't understand them. But he knew that he was different that he wasn't your normal child. That he wasn't your normal baby. And these people are used to come into life. Interruptions aren't meant for us to go back the same way we came. Life's interruptions are to come into our lives and change the way we think. Look at COVID when it hit. We still aren't functioning the same way. In some of those ways, there's the best ways that we're not still functioning the same. I know there's some ways that, that are bad, but there's some ways that that we're not functioning the same because we still have a greater appreciation for people. We still have a greater appreciation for family. We have a greater appreciation for each other. And I hope that doesn't change. I hope we still always walk that way. But guys, when they met their Savior, they left on a different way. Their journey took them a different way because when we meet our Savior, we shouldn't walk away the same. We shouldn't be the same way because when you have an encounter with Jesus, when Jesus comes in and interrupts your life, you don't walk away the same person. You walk away different. You walk away changed and transformed to the point that everybody around you is going to know you're different. They're going to see that you're different. They're going to tell that you're different because it's an overflow of your life. I imagine, just like the shepherds were, when these wise men left and they went a different way, I bet their conversations were different. It was no longer probably what they're going to eat, what they're going to see or anything. It was probably, man, I can't wait to get home to tell people about the king I just met, to tell them about this baby I just met that's going to change the world, and I just know it, to tell them about how Jesus, even though he was just under two years old, changed their life in that little moment that they met him. And so, guys, as I wind this thing up today, You know, I I often think, I want to say I've always responded like the wise men to life's interruptions. I want to say I've always been like them and acted like them and and let life's interruptions take me a good way. Take me on a journey, allow me to meet my Savior where I need to meet him at, and take me back on a different way home. But I can't say that. I, I don't think any of us in this room can say that we've always had that encounter like that. But I think there's a lot of us who would say, you know what? There's times I've been like King Herod. Now, granted, we might not have killed people, but our life's interruptions caused us to act troubled, allow our trouble to eat us away to where we acted out in that secretly, and then our secret life became manifested in our public life, whatever that might look like. And I know for me, for a lot of you know in this room that St. Off and I, we've From day one, we agreed that, you know what, we're going to allow the Lord to bless us with a child. That's the one thing he said, you know, if that's what you want, if you want a a kid, that's what we're going to do. And so year one and two wasn't bad not having a kid because I was still trying to adjust to life, adjust to having two kids. But year three hit, something shifted inside of me completely. Then year four, and by the time year five hit, my world was crashing. And everybody around me saw it. Those of you who have watched this journey unfold, you you know. You all saw it. You all saw it in my Facebook post. You all saw it in the way I talked. You all saw it in the way I acted and responded. I wasn't the same person. I became like King Herod because I allowed the situation to trouble me. And I began to think God couldn't heal me. God couldn't take care of it. 
And then I began to listen to all the lies. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. You're never going to have this happen. You don't deserve to be a mom. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve that. That's what happens. When we follow, when a life interruption happens and we get so distressed, you begin to listen to the lies of the enemy of what is going to happen in your life to the point that you begin to live out those lies. Now, no, I didn't kill people like King Herod, but I became very angry at the world, angry at everything. Anytime I'd see anybody with a baby, I'd be angry. Anytime I'd see a pregnancy post, I'd be angry. Anytime I'd see a baby enter foster care, I'd get angry. Because I thought, God, I know how to love a baby. I know how to love these kids. And these mamas can have kids, but they don't know how to take care of them. They don't know how to love them, but yet here I am begging you. And then something happened. One day, I can't, I can't pinpoint you the exact day. I can't pinpoint to you what happened. But I just got to a place inside that I was like, I'm done. I'm done feeling this way. I hate feeling this way. And physically, I wasn't well because I'm a mama. And I'm going to love everybody's kid as my own. Anybody who knows me knows that when you bring your kid to me, you're not going to have to worry about them. I'll be the first to jerk a knot in their tail if they need it, but then I'll be the first to give them the biggest old hug and to love them right where they're at. But something inside shifted, and I became to be like the wise men. I began to say, you know what, God? You've taken me on a journey, and this journey isn't leaving me the same. Physically, I'm not the same. I have a scar now that I didn't have before, a physical scar. Because your journey is causing me not to go the same way. And just like the wise men, I'm learning. When you have an encounter with your Savior, you're not the same. You're going to look different. You're going to act different. You're going to be different. And everybody around you is going to know something happened when you did that. Because they're going to see it. And they're going to know it. Take the joy and gift and redeem it. Guys, this is, for some reason, Christmas time seems to be the time that most interruptions in life happen. Most things in life seem to snowball. It seems to be the time that if you've lost a loved one, you feel the most grief. It seems to be the time that people we love tend to get sick and, and have health problems they don't typically have. It tends to be the time that that kids, although Santa's coming, it tends to be the time that they act out the most because of all the excitement they don't know how to contain. Or for some, they know they're not getting anything on Christmas because of their life. So it's, but it's that time of year that I even know personally that I fight a lot of battles because I fight a lot of battles of how life was as a kid and, and they try to, those things try to creep in and, and rob me from the joy that I could experience today. But in this season when life can interrupt the most, and we learned that actually from the very first Christmas, the year that Jesus was born, it seemed to set the tone of, you know what? It's going to be a, an interrupting time. But are you going to allow your interruptions in life to turn you like King Herod? that's going to turn you to where you become someone you're not meant to be, you're not created to be? Are you going to allow life interruptions to turn you like the wise men, where you meet your Savior on a journey and you walk away and you're no longer the same? You're completely transformed and you're completely different. You know, all of us in this room are facing our own battles and our own times and our own situations. But I wonder how many of you in this room today would say, you know what? It's time for me to make the decision to give this to my Savior. Let me have an encounter with my Savior. And let me walk out this journey differently. Because I need to be different through this. I don't need to walk out the same. I need to be changed. I need to be transformed. Is there something on me that I need to let go of? It might be a hardness. It might be, it might be a situation that you've held on to for years that you need to say, you know what, I need to lay this down. 
I can't change what happened. I can't change where I've been, but I can change where I'm going. I don't have to be the same. I can experience joy. I can experience peace. I can experience love. Let me tell you something. There's nothing greater than experiencing the love of your heavenly father. Everybody else in this world can love you, but let me tell you something. Jesus can love you like nobody else. Like nobody else. And when you allow him to love you, it's this most wonderful feeling. And it's not, I, I hate using the word feeling because it, it's not its not just a feeling. It changes you. It does something to you. And it makes you walk different. It makes you talk different. It makes you act different. It's been in church for years and say, God, take my life. Come into my life. Change me. And the other group of people I want to talk to is life interruptions have been weighing you down. You're battling. You're struggling. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to respond. Maybe maybe you've even responded like King Herod did, and you're starting to get bitter. You're getting troubled. You're getting angry. You're starting to act secretly. And you need to hurry up and change before you get stuck in that trap. Or maybe you've not decided what you're going to do and how you're going to respond to that. But today is just another day to fall back in line again and say, God, take me on a journey. Let me meet my Savior and let me walk in a different way. Change me, transform me. So if you'll stand with me. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for sending people like King Herod and the wise men to give us examples of how to live life and how not to live life. God, help us today to make the choice for you, to choose you over anything else, to choose you over any interruption we may have, to be able to choose you and say, you know what, this might be the hardest thing I've ever faced in life, but I'm going to choose you, and I'm going to follow you. And so God, today, God, is is this altar is about to be open. God, I just ask for people to have a boldness and a courage like never before to step out and to say, God, here I am. Help me. And we thank you for all that you're going to do in lives and how you're going to change people and how they're going to leave here not the same. Just like the wise men you took on the journey and they left and they weren't the same, that you would do the same for us today in this place, in this very moment, when we give you the praise, the glory, and honor. So, God, if, guys, if you feel that tug on your heart to respond, this altar is open. We've got people who want to pray with you. Don't leave here the same. Don't let life's interruptions keep you from what God has in store. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, I've got an interruption, just come. Come, we've got people that want to pray for you.
want to end differently than we typically do. I want you to find people in your row. If you feel comfortable, I want you to grab hands. I want you to lay hands on them, and I want you to pray for the people in your row. Because, guys, everybody's fighting a battle in here, whether they're willing to come up to an altar or not, or whether they're willing to say, you know what, God, pray for me. They've all got stuff going on, so find somebody and pray with them there together. Pray like a family, because, guys, guess what? We're all one big family in this room. We're all one family, and we all fight these battles together. And I wouldn't want any other family by my side than these people in this room. Because I love you guys greatly, and and we are blessed with the best family. And so I'm going to pray over you guys as you pray for each other. God, I thank you for this amazing family that we have. God, I thank you for who they are, God. I thank you for their blessings of who they are, God. And I just ask, God, that you touch them, God. You know the battles they face, God. You know the situations that they're in, God. You know life's interruptions right now, God. I ask that you go before them, God, that you lead their way. God, you direct their path, God, that you just put your hand upon them. Surround them with your angels. Surround them with your mercy and grace. Give them wisdom where they need wisdom. Give them peace where they need peace. Give them strength and endurance where they need that. Be all that they need. God, I just ask that you fill them up to overflowing. Overflow them on other people, God, and let them, God, change the people around them, God. Move in their hearts, move in their lives like never before, God. And I thank you for who they are, and I thank you that we are family, God. We may not be family by blood, but we're family by spirit.